So he came back with those forms, International Islamic University, Islamabad. Fill them. Now I filled them, but no imagining studying Islam. I, no way. But anyway, I filled them and I was praying that I don't get admission. So I'm taken to the airport. And I'm crying. I was crying because I was leaving my mother. I had my future. I imagine now I'm going to study Islam. How will it help me in future? But I decided, let me just go. But I was telling myself, if it is not good, I'll come back. But I think there was wisdom in the fact that it was a one-way ticket. If it was a return ticket, oh, I would have come back. My names are Sheikh Ibrahim Lethome Asmani. Um, I come from Kajiado County, but I belong to many other places in Kenya. Because if you go to Kerenyaga, a place called Sagana, Sagana Muslim Village, I happened even to be I happen to be the chairman of the mosque there. So Sagana is my home. If you go to Naivasha, a place called Kabati, uh, you'll find people saying, no, he belongs here because that is where I was born. Actually, a place called Kambi, Somali in Naivasha, that's where I was born. If you go to Narok, you'll be told I belong here because that's where my parents hail from. A place called Enai Bilbil, that is where my parents originate from. Uh, so my parents are from Narok, a village called Naibilbil. I belong to a clan called Burgo, Lyser. That is the sub-clan, Lyser, uh, to the family called Oletome. Uh, so even the name Lethome is uh, corrupted from Ole Tome. Uh, many people, of course, would not associate me with the Maasais, but that's where my parents came from. Um, I, my journey begins from Naivasha, that's where I was born as a fourth born in a family of six, three girls and three boys. Uh, we have lost one of ourselves, that is my elder sister Khadija. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on her. Uh, she died about 10 years ago. Both my parents are dead. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on them. They died in Sagana. They are all both buried in Sagana. So Naivasha, as I started now, as far as back as I can remember, my parents became Muslims when you were small. Before that, they belonged to a church called the Salvation Army. Uh, from traditional Maasais, uh, when they moved to town, they became uh, Jeshi Laukov, that is Salvation Army. That is in the early 60s. So by the time I started to realize things, about four or five years old, they became Muslims, alhamdulillah. Because uh, Mze was doing some transactions with the Somalis the Ishaq clan. Actually, even people make fun and say you belong to the Habar Chalo. That is a clan among the Ishaqs. Eh? That's how we became Muslims there as a small boy. Then, of course, the next thing I'm taken to, Mal'ama. We used to call it Mal'ama. It is Duxi, a place where you're going to be taught Islam and Quran. Ah, but for me, that is an experience that was terrible for me. It's an experience I like forgetting. Because I always associated madrasa or mal'ama or duksi with beating. The kind of beating we went through made me every weekend, because you used to go there over the weekend, you, you pray that you fall sick, you don't go to the madrasa. So Friday night you start praying that you get an excuse and the best excuse is you fall sick, you don't go to duksi. And again you go to duksi, you're being taught in Kisomali, not in Kiswahili. So like, Alif la Korebe, Alif la Hostebe, Alif la Gode. That is Alif Fataha in Kisomali, Alif Kasra'i, Alif Doma'u, Alif Wahmali, Be Hoskali. And for me, the beating was bad. And again, we were the only non Somali Muslims. So again, you feel uh, some discrimination. Eh? The kind of names you are being called, like Cherer. Cherer means this King Keher or Madmado things like Nasab Diman, you know, Adon, something like that. So it made me feel I am not very welcome here. Now because of the beating and the rest, so Mze withdrew us from the madrasa. We did not go on with the madrasa for long. So we just went to school. Up to 1973, the village in which we were born, it was called Kambi, Somali, in Naivasha. 
uh, that maximum prison in Naivasha was actually constructed there. So that village had to be demolished. So we moved now to another place called Kabati, still in Naivasha, Kabati. But something happened. My father lost his property, uh, the plot he had there. Uh, he was conned by some relatives. So from 1973, I was in class five then. We moved now to central province. And that's why people wonder, why are you talking about central province? It's because my father happened to meet with people who had gone for tablig. And then he met them in the mosque in Naivasha. And they started discussing about different places where a Muslim can settle. And my father was thinking about resettling in a village where there are Muslims. So he was told in Sagana, there is a new village coming up for Muslims. It's called Sagana Muslim Village or Mjini. So 1973, we found ourselves now relocating. But now the elders, like my eldest sister was married. She was living in Nakuru. The second sister in Kajiado, she was married to a, Soma, a Maasai in Kajiado who became a Muslim. And then me, my, my elder brother had just finished class seven. We are not talking of class eight then, it's class seven. So he, he was living with my elder sister in Nakuru, looking for a job. I'm in class five with the, my younger brother, my youngest brother. So we moved to uh, Sagana. So from 1973, Sagana has been my home. Though I still felt a lot of attachment with Naivasha, but it's Sagana. So I grew up in Sagana. At least now in Sagana, I saw uh, Muslims that belong to other communities because that's a Kikuyu area. So I met now with the Muslims from Kikuyu land because almost everybody, and most of the people actually were rivers in that, in that village, eh? uh, even first generation Muslims. So that's how I grew up there. So Naivasha was in a school called Naivasha DEB school. Uh, then when we shifted to Sagana, I went to a school called AC Sagana, Anglican Church, again under the Anglican Church uh, in Sagana, which now it's called Lower Sagana. They changed the names those days. So I was in that school up to 1975. That is when I did my class seven exams. It was called CPE, Certificate of Primary Education. Uh, at the same time, Within the village is a small madrasa, so we used to go there. Again, a lot of confusion because um, the, the, the Shias came in then. Eh? Some Shia teachers came in. Remember, this is the time of the revolution. Eh? So an organization called Bilal Muslim Mission, they sent there some Shia teachers. Uh, again, it caused a lot of confusion now. You don't know which one to follow. Eh? Which one, which one do you follow? And actually, if you go to Sagana today, you'll find some pockets of Shiism. It's because of them. And actually, some of, our, some of the young people are taken to a school, a Shia school in uh, Makinan Road. It's called Jafari Primary School. And I cried when I was not taken there. Although these days I'm happy about it because the person who was selecting people to go there happened not to like my father. So he left me out as a punishment to my father. But I say, Alhamdulillah, it is good. Maybe today I would be a big Shia Sheikh. Eh? Anyway, so 75, I did my class seven uh, exams and I passed, okay. I think I was leading in that region, Alhamdulillah. The two, there were two schools that were combined together. I was leading and I went to a school called Moya High School from one up to from four, that is up to 79. Again now, because I went to boarding school, I was cut off now from studying religion. And I was not keen, let me tell you, I had developed a very negative attitude about studying. Because for me, the Quran means being beaten. Eh? So I never liked it. Eh? So you can imagine all those years I was in uh, uh, that boarding school, because it's a boarding school, Moya boys. Prayers, very occasionally. Uh, I had a very good excuse of not praying because this is a Christian school. I'm the only, I was the only Muslim for four years. The first Muslim ever in that school, where boys high school. Eh? I left that record of as being the only Muslim there. Um, and of I was going to church when I was there. Yeah, it's a Catholic school, so we used to go to church. I even many songs that hymns and Christian prayers, I memorized them from there. But I remained a Muslim, let's say by name. When I was in Form 4, I was even made the head boy of the school. The first ever head boy in that school who is a Muslim, when the name is there. And then, uh, of course, holidays, I would go back, uh, still my attachment with the village, Sagana Muslim village. And it happened that the chairman of the mosque liked me so much because I was the first 
um, boy from that village now to go to a good government secondary school. You know, I like those day, these days, people going to private school is seen as very prestigious. Those days, actually you go to private schools because you could not perform well to go to a government school. Because we had two types of schools, eh? three. We had the government schools, anybody going there is a person who has performed well. Then we used to have Harambe schools. These are schools built by communities. Then private schools, which were very few then. And the Harambe and the private were people who could not be admitted in the government schools. So I can consider myself to have been in a prestigious school, although a village school where I never saw a dining hall. We used to eat Nachukua Chakula from the kitchen, a Mabati kitchen, then you go and sit on the wood, firewood, then you go to the river. There is a river called uh, a river called the Viva River. That is the river that irrigates the, the rice fields there. We used to, sometimes you meet cobras on the way. It's snake infested. Eh? And then, you know, there are so many frogs because of the irrigation. So snakes, there are many snakes. I remember even next to the hostel, which we used to call Kibaberi. So it's a big uh, Mabati shark. Uh, snakes would come in sometimes and next to the, 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 the I mean, the, the, the hostel, we used to call it uh, Kibaberi. There were some snakes around there. You'd always meet snakes around there. So for four years, I was there, then finished. Those were days of uh, A-levels. So I went to Gedega High School in Kiambu for my A-levels. That was now in 1982. That's when I did my A-levels there. At least now I went to school with about five Muslims. Eh? And for the first time, I met a Muslim from Mandera. I remember it's called Abbas. Ma Abbas Ma'alim, I see him working with the Ministry of uh, Education here. He's in Jogo House, yeah, we meet him now. He was the smallest. Then I remember a politician from Moranga called Hassan uh, Adams. He was with us and a few people from Coast Province. At least now I had a group of Muslims there. And the, the, the principal of the, the headmaster of the school happened to be a Muslim also, an Asian Muslim. He was called Mr. Muhammad Sarwar from here in Nairobi. Uh, at least now I, I was in a school where the, the headmaster is a Muslim, then there are a few other Muslims. And I became the head boy again in that school, Gedega High School, I was made the head boy. I don't know what qualities they saw in me. And of course I was in football there and I used to like running in the school. Then I finished my A-levels in 1982. I went back to my former school, that is Mwea. Again, anything to do with religion, I don't want, no. Nothing to do with studying Islam, Actually, I'm planning to get further and further away from Islam. So I went to back to where, boys. So I was teaching there, waiting now to join the university. Okay, I did not get a place in the university. So I decided I want to do teaching. So I applied for teaching, but before I could get it, my father passed away. And uh, I remember 22nd of June, uh, 1982, my father passed away. It was in the month of Ramadan, I remember very well. Uh, that was a turning point for me because uh, during the burial of my father, among the people who came to attend the burial was uh, an old man now dead called uh, Nurumze from Maragua. He happened to be the provincial vice chair of Supkem, Supreme Council of Kenya Muslims. And my history with Supkem goes back to those years in A-levels. By the way, I forgot to say when I went for A-levels, my two years, uh, A-level was paid for by Supkem. I remember they gave one check. It was for the two years, it was 3,200. I still remember. It covered my two years. Boarding in a boarding school facility, everything. Yeah, 3,200. Eh? And actually people thought I come from a very rich family, not knowing that why I was assisted is because the family could not afford to pay for me, uh, the school fees. And even for all levels, uh, I remember from form one to form four, I was at the mercy of the school because my family could not afford to pay for me school fees. Uh, and actually people were wondering, where are you going to secondary school? Because almost everybody in the village, primary school, and they go and do kibaruas. Uh, actually, they used to tell me, you know? So after form four, it was, mm, after form four, you're not studying anymore. Because there's nobody else who has gone beyond that. So I went for A-levels. Mm. And you know, I was lucky, somebody just came and said, Supkem can pay for me. So Supkem paid for me through Nurumze, may Allah have mercy on him. So finished my A-levels. So again, 
Now, during the burial of my father, Nur Mzeh comes and says, there is a univ an Islamic university in Pakistan, and we are looking for students who have uh, completed A-levels to go there, Muslim students. Do you have any here? And everybody points at me. That is the only person. He's a son to the old man we've just buried. Abu Maliza, A-levels, take him. Ah, an Islamic university, me? Study Arabic? I said, no way, I'm not going over my dead body. Me, I want to study here, do something. I was very fond of doing agriculture and other things. I was more of science. Now I'm around 20. I'm around 20 years old at that time. So uh, what happened? He was very wise. Huh? He knew I'm still mourning my father. I just lost my father. Uh, that was just a day after he died. And uh, mourning, he told me he'll come back after one week. So he came back with those forms. International Islamic University, Islamabad. Fill them. <sighs> now I filled them, but you know, imagining studying Islam. I, no way. But anyway, I filled them and I was praying that I don't get admission. Yeah, that was around June, June 1984. Then uh, after a month, the admission came. I was admitted to go and do Arabic one year because I was zero in Arabic. Eh? Then uh, uh, study now Sharia and law. Now, again, I'm back to this thing I hate. I'm going to study this religion that I don't want to study, a language of slave traders. You know, in primary school, eh? the East African history is about slave trade. And then you'd see uh, drawings and pictures of Arabs with the Africans, you know, chained. And so I'm going to study this language of, mm -mm. and then the confusion that had been created, Sunnis here, then Shias here, all that confusion. I didn't want to get into that confusion. So anyway, admission has come. But I had a very good excuse of not going. I didn't have a passport. So I had a person who had married one of my sisters, a Shia teacher, actually. A Shia teacher is called Malim Saeed Ali Hirbai. He's still teaching in Makinan Road, a Shia school. Eh? I'd married my younger sister, Fatuma. So he organized for me to get the passport. And you know how much it was? 600 shillings. Yes, I got a 50-page passport. Then I got the passport on the 19th of October, 1984. Then I had another excuse. Because I was looking for every excuse not to go. I didn't have a ticket. But somebody went to the Saudi embassy here in Nairobi and got me a ticket, a one-way ticket. Pakistan International Airlines. And you see, outside here, this IECA building, now Jaquat building, you see these windows facing the mosque. That was where the offices of Pakistan International Airlines was. PIA, there's a big PIA, great people to fly with. That's my first airline to fly with, 1984. So I remember I was told to go to the embassy to collect the check. So I feared Nairobi so much. Eh? because we were told many stories about Nairobi. So from Sagana, I would come, then walk from Machakos bus station to Modaiga, where the embassy is there, following the road like a car, because just in getting into any street, I'll get lost. So I'll just be walking there. I remember walking there, got to the embassy. Uh, somebody from Supkem had organized for me. I went and collected the check. But I think the way I looked and the way I was in tattered clothes, dirty clothes, when I took the check here, they could not trust it. So they told me to tell the person who has given the check to call. And those are not the era of mobile phones. Eh? You have to go to an office to make a call. And I, I never thought Jamia would help me. Jamia, of course, was not as big as it is now. Uh, the Imam here was an old man called Sheikh Ramadan. I didn't find him myself. And of course, I had nothing to affiliation with mosques. Uh -uh. So again, I walked back there and told the ambassador to call the office here, PIA. So he told me, now take the check. So walking twice eh, a day. Today, if you tell me to do that, I don't know whether I'll be able to walk to Modaiga twice. Eh, but I did that. Even going to the embassy of Pakistan to get a visa. You know where it is now? Church Road, eh? Westlands, off Wayakiwe, walking from here. Following the highway, I remember one of the, 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 the 
what do you call it, the, the, the milestones to mark that I'm on the right path. Boulevard Hotel, after the university, no, VOK, then Boulevard Hotel, then walk, 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 until you, you see Kentucky Fried Chicken. That was KFC then, used to be called Kentucky Fried Chicken. It used to be there. And Uchumi, then I know now you go, then you find a church there, then you find the Pakistani embassy. So it was just walking because I used to fear getting into those KBS buses, I would get lost. And I didn't like Nairobi, I feared Nairobi so much. So anyway, uh, on the 19th, again of November, 1984, I traveled to Pakistan, uh, getting into the plane for uh, the first time. And the air, the, the air ticket, you know how much it was? 4,500. I still remember. I still have part of that ticket because those days it was like a checkbook. Eh? It is not like now. Today actually you don't even have something physical. It is uh, in soft form. Eh? Those days it was like a checkbook. So it is torn. I still have the counterfoil up to now. My first time to fly to Pakistan. So I'm taken to the airport. And I'm crying. I was crying because I was leaving my mother. I, my future, imagine now I'm going to study Islam. How will it help me in future? But I decided let me just go. But I was telling myself, if it is not good, I'll come back. But I think there was wisdom in the fact that it was a one-way ticket. If it was a return ticket, oh, I would have come back. So I went to Pakistan. I had a pocket money of 50 shillings only. I think that is the only money I had. 50K, 50 shillings, Kenya shillings. Eh? Uh, so I arrived in uh, Abu Dhabi. To date, that airport, when I see it, I remember my first flight ever. It's like a dome like this. And then we were told to go out and walk around, then come back. Uh, for, it is the first time I meet now people who are Africans, but they cannot speak Kiswahili. Because I was greeting them in Kiswahili. You know, I thought any, any African speak Kiswahili. Then I would greet them and they would look at me, what are you saying? You know, so I realized, oh, there are other Africans in the world. Eh? Because me, I thought they are Swahili speaking people. Then I got to Karachi late in the night. Then in the morning, we got in another flight now, connection to Islamabad. So in the plane to Islamabad, uh, I'm, I met a person from Jamaat Tablik. He sat next to me and he asked me where I'm going. Because of course, I looked different like, than the other people. Uh, who are you? Where are you going? I said, I'm going to study Islam. I'm from Kenya. And he gave me 50 rupees. And that was a lot of money then, 50 rupees. Eh? Uh, so I landed in Islamabad very early in the morning and it was at the peak of winter because November, December, January, February, it's winter in Pakistan, very cold. And I was going to the almost the coldest place. Islamabad is near some hills called Margala Hills. It's very cold at the foothills of those uh, there. Uh, so I got there. I was received by, I, I'll never forget that teacher. He's called uh, Hamid Sharif. Uh, very friendly because actually uh, when I the process of going here and there and um, trying to get now to settle down I was late actually they told me I'm very late because the semester was ending in a month you know and I had to sit for exams in Arabic because now I was supposed to go to the basic class then I don't have winter clothes fortunately the brothers who received me there some of them I still see them some of them have passed away from Garissa uh, they were Kenyan Somalis from Garissa. They received me very well and they even gave me warm clothes. Then I found other Kenyans. There was a brother called Harun from Mombasa. We were two Kenyans and three Ugandans that had gone at the same time. Uh, although Harun just did one year and came back to Kenya. He's a businessman in uh, Mombasa now. Um, so the biggest challenge now was you go into class, you don't know anything. I remember I cried and said, I want to go back home. And I saw no future. There is no future here. So I remembered I've left my mother still mourning, you know. Um, my mother had very high hopes in me helping her. You know, I've come to study something I don't like, you know. Actually, I remember crying, crying. Then somebody came and asked me why I'm crying. said, I want to go back home to Kenya. I told me, no, just persevere. I used to love football so much. So I, somebody who was a, a football player from Ghana, who was my roommate, because I lived in a room with two Ghanaians. One now is in Switzerland, it's called uh, Kaita, Abu Bakr Kaita. He's a big businessman settled in Switzerland. The other one is called Jabir, 
I don't know where he is, but those are the people I lived with. Uh, and then there was a watchman there who used to be very kind to me. He would cover me at night when I'm very cold because winter, it was terrible. So anyway, to cut a long story short, I persevered. The f exams came. No, now some, some Muslim brothers from Kenya, they took, every night they would come and sit with me now to train me on how to answer questions. Because if I don't pass, I'll be referred back. Or if I don't, uh, if I fail three papers, then I'll be, re uh, I'll repeat, no, I'll just be sent back home until next semester. Uh, and then maybe if I pass, I, I fail one or two, I'm given another chance. So they helped me. I don't know whether the teachers just favored me or not because I passed, just pass. I still have that transcript. It shows pass. In the meantime, I am meeting Muslims now from different parts of the world. Chinese Muslims, the first time to see a Japanese Muslim, of course, from a black American Muslim, from all over the world, Muslims. That made, gave me courage. Oh, no, this religion doesn't belong. For me, it was a religion for Arabs, for Somalis and Indians. But now I see people from different countries in this. And of course, I used to love football. I joined the football team and I used to enjoy that after, uh, during Asri time, we would break and pray in the field. That was very exciting for me. Uh, Pakistan became home for me. And now I decided to, I, I, I discovered Islam slowly. I was reading for myself now. It's like I'm discovering Islam for the first time now, for myself. Reading books and never, I said, I promised myself, promise myself if I passed the first semester, I'll never fail again. So Alhamdulillah, I finished the first year Arabic. Now at least I could read Arabic. I could read now Quran a little bit. Not very good, but I could read Quran. And now I was able now to join uh, Kuliyat Sharia and Qanun, and Qanun. That is the Department of Law and Sharia, doing both Sharia and Law. Uh, it was a course that took me four years, studying Law and Sharia, Alhamdulillah. Then 1989, I finished my first degree. All this time, people are going home for holidays, but for me, the three months holiday, summer holidays, just staying there. I could not afford a ticket. You know, I could not afford that ticket to come home here. So we just used to stay there. Many of us would stay there for those three months, traveling around. But uh, students were very helpful, like students from Sudan. They had an association. They would even take us. They had uh, centers in different parts of Pakistan. So we would travel all over the place. They would also organize classes for us to strengthen our Arabic and the religion. We used to go for camps also during uh, holidays. And Alhamdulillah, we learned a lot. So 1989, I finished my first degree and I felt now I needed to do something else. So I registered for my master's degree, but I was missing my mother so much. It's almost five years I've not seen her. So some people helped me raise a ticket. The university never used to help us uh, with the tickets. You have to organize that from home. So for five years, I've not seen my mother. People have forgotten me at home. The only communication is once in a while, a letter, you know. But I, I came to love Pakistan and the environment in the university, uh, more because of the interaction with the students. Eh? The student bodies, they were very active. That's why I even learned my few Turkish words, Nasin Sim, Iyim, Noreg, Dorsun. That's why I learned, because there are many Turkish brothers. Remember one of the brothers now is a very senior person in the government. It's called Omar Farouk. Uh, he, he was there among the people who received us there. He was one year my senior. So 1989, I came back for two months. I had already registered. I wanted to register first, then come home, have a very good excuse for going back. Eh? So 1989, I came back. And one of my missions there is, because I had already now studied about the difference between Shiism and Sunnism. When I came back, our small mosque had been taken over by the Shias. So I had that, um, I had the, 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 I, I purposed to make sure that people in the village understand the difference. We have been Sunnis all through. Um, this is not the right thing. The chairman, who later became my, my grandfather-in-law, but by then I didn't know Almari from him, from that family, he was called Mze Shaban Muhina. I was able to convince him that this is not the right aqidah for us here. And Alhamdulillah, he was able to remove them. Because I, I had now studied about Shiism and the difference between Shiism and Sunnism. 
So that was for the two months that I was there. I went to Mombasa uh, to visit a sheikh who was called Sheikh Uthman and Sheikh Siraj. So they gave me books about exposing Shiism and the, 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 the difference between us and Shiism. Uh, I used them for those two months actually that was my main mission and I was able now to remove them but I was going back. Of course it was sad for my mother. Uh, why do you want to go back after all these years? Will I ever see you again? Uh, I might be dead by the time you come. But now the issue of aqidah and uh, trust in Allah. Now I, I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to learn Islam. I know I can even quote some verses and tell her we have to trust in Allah. If Allah wants me to come back when you're still alive, I'll come back, don't worry. So I went back there. But as I was doing my masters, I also registered for, I, I, I love teaching because even in Kenya, I had joined a college, eh? Teacher, teacher's college, Meru Teacher's College, before I left. So I, um, I decided to do a degree in teaching also from the, the Punjab University in Lahore. Mm -hmm. So as I was doing my master's, I was also doing uh, uh, that course in education. And I managed to get a bachelor's degree in education, uh, which was very good. And that's why even now I like teaching a lot, more than practicing law. So 1993, I finished my master's, worked as a teacher there for six months to raise some money to buy books and also be able to come and begin life in Kenya. So I came back in 1993, got married the same year because now I was becoming a little bit old. My mother was concerned I might die before seeing uh, my grandchildren. You know, your younger brother is already married, your younger sister is, you are the only one. So Alhamdulillah, I got married in 1993. I was a student at the law school. And that is the year I joined Jamia Mosque as a committee member, 1993. That is what, yes, Farooq Adam, may Allah give him good health and a long life. That is when he recruited me into Jamia Mosque, when the Imam was a, a sheikh called Sheikh Ali, Ali Sheh. Uh, people in Lamu call him Ali Lodi. That's when I joined him. And it was baptism by fire. There were a lot of there were a lot of problems in Jamia. So I joined Jamia in 1993. The chairman was an old man called uh, uh, was called Mze uh, Maulidi uh, Jasho. The secretary general happened to be the same secretary general we have now, Sheikh Abdul Bari. But he left here. He left and then came back. Eh? There's a time he left and Mze Warfa. The, the current chairman became the secretary general. Then Abdul Bari came back again from Canada and took over. The vice chairman was Farouk Adam. Yeah, Farouk Adam. No, until recently when uh, Professor Isaiah G took over, he was the vice chairman. So again, by joining Jamia helped me also understand Islam better. So law school, uh, Jamia, and also Sagana Muslim Mosque because there were elements of Shiism that I was fighting and also things that I thought were not right like people going to the graves and the rest. I felt it was not right. So I was struggling with all that. Then I finished my law school in 1995. I was admitted into the bar as a lawyer now, an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. And then me and somebody called Muhammad, Muhammad Sheba, is the brother to the Jamia's lawyer, Ali Mahmoud. Yeah, we formed a small firm, legal firm called Muhammad and Lethome Advocates. So I was practicing. At the same time, I was working for an NGO called Al Muntada Al Islamic Trust. Uh, I worked there as the deputy director. Then I left and joined another one called International Islamic Relief Organization, where the Kenya Arab Society is that building. That's where our offices were. And later on, I left the NGO world and I was focusing on the practicing, practicing law. Then uh, now the issue of the new constitution came up. No, because uh, uh, I had started now becoming vocal about Muslim issues, eh? talking about um, issues affecting us as Muslims and the rest. And Jamia was uh, slowly honing me up. And I forgot to say something. The late Ahmad Khalif made me his deputy secretary general. Of, yes, I was the deputy secretary general for Ahmad Khalif. Yes, the late Ahmad Khalif, minister of labor, who died in the cra uh, plane crash. Yeah. Again, now joining a soup camp gave me now an opening to understand the politics within Islam. Eh? Oof, you know, maybe that's a story for another day. 
but it was helping me understand issues affecting us as Muslims and also dynamics, our differences, uh, you know, within the Muslim Ummah. You know, I was very naive when I came back. I forgot also to say I worked with Wami. Wami. Officers were at Impala. You know where Impala House is? Eh? Wami was there. The director, the, East, the direct, director for East Africa was um, the Abdurrahman Khamis. He's still there. Uh, then later on, of course, the officers moved to Park Road. And the, the directorship changed from Abdurrahman Khamis to Professor Badamana. He took over from Abdurrahman Khamis. So I had a short stint with Wami. I stopped working with Wami when I joined the Kenya School of Law. But even as a student at the Kenya School of Law, Al Muntada accepted me to work with them, even as a student. Yeah. So all these now opened my mind about the Muslims in Kenya. What are some of the challenges facing us? And I started becoming a little bit vocal on Muslim issues. And Jamia, of course, nurtured me a lot eh? because now I'm a member of Jamia Mosque. You know, I have a lot of history of Jamia from 1993 up to now. And I want to thank Farouk Adam. Actually, he's the one who brought me in uh, together. We came in together with the, uh, Professor Badamana and Mzewarfa. We joined together at uh, Jamia Mosque at that time. So that is my history with Jamia Mosque. But then, as I was practicing law, now the issue of the constitution came up. Now, the review of the constitution. And the Muslims joined the Ufungamano initiative uh, where religious communities were coming together uh, and see whether our contribution to the uh, constitution. Remember, Moi then had said, this is something that will only be done by politicians. Wanjiko anajua nini? That's why the name Wanjiko came in. Many people don't know. Where Wanjiko came from Moi himself. He said, that's how you came the Wanjiko. Wanjiko came from Moi himself. So we were in uh, Fungamano. Of course, before uh, we, had, uh, we, we could agree as Muslims to join, we formed a consortium called the Muslim Consultative Council, MCC. We remember people like Abdullahi Abdi, people like Abdurrahman Wandati, Abdul Hamid Silach. Actually, Abdul Hamid Silach was very key in that. Eh? And Kina Said Athman, now I think working with the Ministry of Tourism, um, we, we, we wanted to know whether is it right for us to join uh, the constitution. Because remember, we are divided as Muslims. Eh? Um, this is a man-made constitution. Many people say the Quran is our constitution, although I don't accept that uh, statement. The Quran is not our constitution. It is the source of our constitution. Should we join, should we not join? And I remember Sheikh Musallam and other sheikhs. And that was the first time ever for me to stand up in front of a hall full of Muslims at the Pan-Africa Hotel uh, to state the position that we should take and how we can, uh, we can have an Islamic constitution. What inspired me? The teachings of Maududi, Abdullah, Abu, Abu al-A'la al-Maududi. You know? And I remember I had a book on the Islamic constitution from Pakistan. So I used that and prepared a lecture. And that is the first time I realized I could speak in public, you know, uh, and in a very passionate way. And I was able to argue my case that uh, as Muslims, we should participate in this. There is something we can call an Islamic constitution. So we should not uh, uh, leave the others. Uh, we should join um, that, uh, that, that, that uh, process of uh, reviewing the constitution to protect our rights as Muslims. So when it was time for Muslims to uh, appoint a person to represent them in the People's Commission, Ufungamano, I found myself there, myself, Sayyid Athman, and Abu Bakr Zain. Abu Bakr Zain uh, used to be in Iala, until recently was in Iala. He was an appointee of uh, ODM in Iala. So we found ourselves in uh, Ufungamano, now agitating for our rights in the constitution together with the religious leaders. So I remember going to Kisumu when NDP joined Kano. We had it very rough in Kisumu because now it's like we were opposing the government and the government was so powerful. Remember the car we went with was burnt down. We were beaten there with stones. But a few months down the line, um, the, the, the review, the Constitution Review Commission, CKRC, that was under Yash Palgai, negotiated and some of us from now the people's commission ufungamano were absorbed into this commission and that's how i found myself now in the 
uh, CKRC, the 26 member commission with people like PLO Lumumba, Yashpal Gai, people like the former Attorney General, Professor Gedo Mwigai, uh, the former chairman of IBC, Ahmed Ishaq, Professor Abdurazak Nuno, Professor Salim Ida, uh, Professor Swazuri, Mohammed Swazuri, yeah, can, uh, Professor Wanjiko Kabira and others. Others have passed away, like Professor Okodo Gendo and others. We found ourselves there, CKRC. Of course, now it become very vocal on Muslim issues. Eh? That there, the Kadis court must remain in the constitution, no? a champion of Muslim issues there. I was very vocal now. Stopped practicing law uh, uh, for the period, for the five periods that I was there. I was not practicing. Of course, I'm still in charge of uh, Sagana Muslim Mosque. And um, I felt also I want to have a place of my own. That's why I'd always had my heart in Masai land. Narok very far. Again, when we became Muslims, we were cut off from the family. Yeah, because of being Muslims. Yeah. So for all these years, we, have not, we are not in touch with the family. We are cut off completely, completely. Uh, actually, people used to wonder, how can a Maasai family be in central province? It's because we were cut off from the family. They didn't want anything to do with us after becoming Muslims. Of course, when I started appearing on TV sometimes, once in a while, I used to appear on KBC program called Ukumbi wa Kislam. Uh, so they saw me there, when they saw the surname, so some of the relatives started now looking for us. We were able to reconnect, but you see, well, we didn't feel that bond, eh? because we were cut off for a very long time. Eh? And these are very staunch Christians, oh, born again Christians. And here we are, maybe born again Muslims, you can say that. It was not easy. Yeah. But I've kept in touch with them. When there is something, a wedding or barrio, I keep going there. One or two accepted Islam through that, many interactions. The rest have remained staunch uh, uh, Christians. Uh, so that's how uh, life has been. But I remember now when this Mumbai terrorism came. Again, my family from Narok came. After the Garissa attack, a delegation, three vehicles, they came home. My mother was still alive, so they came to Sagana. Because my mother refused to move away from Sagana. Me, I had moved in Kajiado, built my home there. I wanted to be in Masai land, near Nairobi. She refused and she said she wants to die next to where the husband died, my father. So both are buried in Sagana. So now during this issue of terrorism now, now my family from Narok, they came pleading with me. You know, you're saying you're a good person. What are you doing here? Now I had to explain to them, this is not Islam. These are people who have misinterpreted Islam and the rest. But they could not. You even, you know, relatives come home. You even offer them a place to sleep. They would rather go and sleep in a hotel. Because they don't trust you fully because of Mumbai terrorism. So this is how it has been uh, for me. And I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, I don't practice law. My passion now is in talking about Islam. Uh, I am in an organization called BRAVE. BRAVE is an abbreviation for Building Resilience Against Violent Extremism. We came together in 2015 as Muslim professionals and a few Muslim scholars and formed this organization where I'm the Secretary General. So what we do is to try and demystify Islam and also explain uh, jihad, what jihad means in Islam, what it is. And we also try to correct certain misconceptions about Islam to especially the non-Muslims. And then the youth, some of them who are attracted to this ideology, extreme ideology, trying to correct them. So this is what I do. Some, and out of that, I even do consultancies with the UN. Like now I'm doing some work with the UNODC to train prison officers and other uh, people on uh, understanding Islam. Remember, uh, people who are arrested on suspicion of being terrorists, they end up in prison. The prison officers don't know how to handle them. So uh, UNODC discovered me, so actually I trained them on how to, yeah. And I find it for me as a Dawa program because mono, many of them now have become, have come to understand what Islam is. And they have changed their attitude about Islam through those programs. Because most of them are Christians, they are not Muslims. So I do those programs, I do consultancies. I have stopped practicing, uh, but almost every day I have to advise somebody on uh, a legal matter. 
Uh, but my heart is more on Sharia than uh, practicing law. I have my own personal reasons why I'm not. Very, but if there's a legal issue affecting the Muslims, I always find myself in the forefront. Uh, I am passionate about giving talks on Islam and giving khutbas, but mostly about, uh, what do you call it, uh, current issues. Huh? When an issue happens, then I want to talk about it from an Islamic perspective. When it is time for elections, I want to talk about uh, what does Islam say about this. When Shakahola happened, I want to talk about what does Islam say about Shakahola and many other things. So that's where I am now. Yeah, actually, it's a big challenge. It's a very big challenge. And you know, I sympathize with anybody who has become a Muslim because most, most often than not, they are cut off from the family. So they find themselves being very lonely. And on the other hand, I think we don't have structures to absorb them uh, into the, the Muslim community. Uh, I, I think we need to, to have structures that will absorb them uh, into uh, Islam. But one thing I want to, my advice first goes to the, uh, those who revert to Islam, because the word we use here is not converting, but reverting, because we believe every person is born a Muslim, but the environment in which they grow maybe influences them to go to other religions. Uh, number one, remember you are you become a Muslim because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not because of anybody. And it's not easy because you'll be forced to move from your comfort zone. That's for sure. Okay, so prepare yourself for that. But it's also very rewarding because you'll come to have a very a peace of mind and the rest. Uh, on the other hand, do not, if you look at the Muslims, I'm talking to the reverts and the non-Muslims, you might misjudge Islam by looking at the Muslim themselves. Because some of us do not practice Islam the way it is. We have our weaknesses. Maybe I personally, maybe I have hurt somebody who is a new Muslim because of my character or misled them. So my appeal to those who revert to Islam, do not judge Islam by looking at the Muslims. Because some of us are not practicing Islam the way it is supposed to be. So judge Islam according to the teachings because Islam will remain the same, a good religion, very welcoming. The character of the Prophet ﷺ is a good example to look at. So that's what I would tell the reverts. Just persevere, judge Islam according to the teachings, not according. And don't trust anybody. Don't trust everybody who tells you, I'm going to take you through this journey. Now, for the Muslims, the born Muslims, or those who are already in Islam, uh, I think we should fear Allah and know that these people who have come to Islam they're going to face a lot of difficulties. And remember, this is like a born child. And what I tell people is that the day a person declares the shahada, first of all, all the past is forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That person is so clean, but so innocent also is like a child. So you need to hold their hands as they take their baby steps. Eh? Help them through. Don't exploit them. You know, uh, you might give them a very wrong impression of Islam. Yeah. Uh, the first impression here, yeah, we should give them a good impression, help them, give them company, guide them through this journey. And it's not enough for a person to come to the mosque and declare the shahada, then we say takbir Allahu Akbar. We should ask ourselves, how does this person begin the journey? So, so we should be able, just sacrifice your time and resources. If each one of us would hold, get hold of one river, take them through the journey of life. I think that would be very good. We need to embrace them. We need to remember them. Like now, we are about to celebrate Eid. Some of them have no families to celebrate with because they have been cut off from the family. So we need to think about that. We need to have, uh, and I want to commend somebody like Sheikh Yassin, uh, Sheikh Ali in Mombasa, is uh, in charge of this Majlis Ma'arif. You know, that institution has done a lot. It's almost, among the very few institutions that absorb reverts and take them through the journey. And then Marcus Aisha here in Kiambu also, they're doing a commendable job. And then Guloni also, we had a center. We need to have these kind of centers where reverts go and they, they run through it. And I think even the rivers themselves, they should make efforts to learn. Don't just be satisfied with being down there. Learn Islam. You know, make efforts to learn Islam. So whether it is within the country and outside, I think people should learn, 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 learn. Just make sure you read, get somebody you can trust to take you through that journey. And Islam is a beautiful religion. Uh, when I look back, sometimes I say, imagine if 
I dropped out of Islam. Imagine that day when I was going to Pakistan, it did not happen. But I believe it was God's plan. Eh? It is not by accident. Yeah. So I look at the day my father was buried as a turning point for me. Before, I hated Islam. I, want, I didn't want anything to do with Islam. After that, Alhamdulillah. And here I am today talking for Islam. No regrets, Alhamdulillah.